Hello everyone, I'm Douglas County Vice Chair and District 3 Commissioner Terenia Carthen. In this segment of my district dialogue, we will learn more about Simpson and Daughters Mortuary when we return. Welcome back. Joining us today are the owners of Simpson's and Daughters Mortuary. Welcome to the show, Ms. Letitia Simpson Campbell and her beautiful daughter, Ms. Nicole Malone. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. So we are sitting here today in the historic Simpson and Daughters Mortuary. Can you give us a little history about this building and how Simpson and Daughters came to be? Okay, well, back in 1964, it wasn't in this building, it was a little cinder block building on Clarkwood Street that my father started. He was just looking for a place to start his funeral home. He wasn't from here, and it was rural Douglasville, so he started over there first. He was there for about 55 months. And this building, which was the Hutchinson High School, the historic Hutchinson High School, it was here, uh -huh. and it was abandoned. And um, I think they made a have a few little dances and things of like that, recreation things, but as, as mostly it was a, just abandoned. Mm -hmm. So he found out about the building. This was in 1969. So he purchased it so he could have more space and everything. And uh, that's where Simpson, at the time of Simpson, moved over here. So it was still, it was integrated as far as to time, 1968, but it was still had a very segregated feel to it. Because Hutchison High School was the first integrated high school within, no, was no. it? It was just black. It was yeah, it was, it was built in 1936. They didn't have a high school. It was integration at the time. Right. And, and then after they clo this school closed, they moved into what is now known as Stewart Middle School, but it was R.L. Cousins. Mm -hmm. yes. High school, and when they were there, and when it integrated in 1968, they went to Douglas County High School. The history of Douglas County, it's amazing. Yes, it is. It is, it is. It is. So, 1964, mm -hmm. your, your, your father decided, I am going to start a mortuary. Yes. What made him do that? Well, he went to school uh, in Atlanta okay. in the 40s after World War II. So, I didn't know. I, I know just my father was just working. He worked at Lockheed. He started Lockheed. He was probably the, one of some of the first black to move to, you know, work at Lockheed in 1953. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he was a mortician. And he worked for prominent funeral homes and different things, you know, as a young person before he was married. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't know to today why he came to Douglasville. But I do know that at that time, I-20 wasn't built and I-20, as far as blacks was moving, they were moving uh, east, north or south of I-20, going east. Mm -hmm. Douglasville uh, was west, and blacks really weren't moving out this way at that time, but they still needed a, a mortuary. There was a mortuary here, I think it was called Hamlet or Hamlet, but he, he didn't stay, so my father came. So he had some resistance a little, you know, because he, not just black, but the new kid on the block, so to speak, so, but he was a very outspoken person, so he got his way. He went to people and asked the people who were here. In fact, actually, uh, Alfred Page, uh, we just celebrated Miss Martha Page 100th birthday, it was her husband. He came to her house, and they talked, and they, um, he told him about the schools, and he told him, you know, the people who he could get in contact with so he could come here. But let me mention this. On Cocker Street was a Dr. Young mm -hmm. who uh, helped him. And although they didn't belong to the same congregation, they belonged to the same church, which was the Church of Christ. And I suppose as a brother to a brother, he helped him and he, you know, financed the first funeral home uh, on Cockwood Street. So he came over here, and I was not, I was 10, so I was not involved. Right, right. It was just him, and I didn't even think about it. Uh, it was nothing, I, I, I remember, but I just wasn't thinking about it because we were from Atlanta, so, but it was exciting. I can only imagine because during those times, it wasn't easy for your dad to just go to a bank 
and get financing yeah. or just walk in and say, hey, I have a business idea that I want to do. The good part about it, although that's true, but because it was segregated mm -hmm. and this was black property, one of, wasn't anybody interested in, and ah. it was on the, and it was on the books. Ah. They need to get rid of it. They needed to get rid of it. So right place, right time. Right time. <laughs> so it because of that, uh -huh. the buying it was not that uh, difficult. difficult because it was not that expensive at that time because they was trying to get rid of it. Saying that he even had that thought that I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to give you know my community a service that I know that they so desperately need. Even at that, even in the service, you could imagine as well, a funeral home was not just a funeral home. A person coming in as a professional, a lot of people needed other things. How to buy houses, you know, uh, things, trouble, they, they go to the person who they feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So it's not was just doing funeral services. It was helping people doing other things. Wow. And that's what he did. Wow. And, and when sometimes when it was, even when the law was involved and everything, he would help people get out of jail, talk to the correct officials because he didn't have any type of uh, uh, shyness when it came to uh, speaking up. Gotcha. In fact, it, it was a lady and she told me, she said, and I, I don't know if this is good or bad, but she said, your father was the first black man I saw talking to a white man as a equal. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I don't know what they were saying, but they were just, just talking. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, okay, well, I didn't really understand at the time, but I know now, right. you know. So, uh, like he had some pushback, but he had grit, mm. you know, he had true grit. And you have to remember the time that my father uh, came out here before when he was a younger man, he was in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And Atlanta was being integrated and, and everything. In fact, the Martin Luther King that the world knows, he knew him before he went to that level because he was... Uh, Dating and stuff, just like my daddy was dating. Yeah. <laughs> so we were so, in the same circus. circus, right? You, you know, you had because uh -huh. you were going to school and everything. Right. He had finished. Well, Dr. King had finished, but but he still was dating. That's before he met his wife, and you know. And so my father met my mother mm -hmm. at the uh, greatest school of nursing and, and everything mm -hmm. like that. And, and I asked, you know, of course, I had to ask about Martin Luther King, and and they said they called him Junior, and okay. he was very intelligent. He was always neat. They had good conversation and you know, he about the girls Coca Cola or something like that and that's it. So right. so very much so. Your dad was a pillar in the community. He was a pillar. And and it's it's so interesting that you would say that the funeral home just wasn't the funeral home. No, it, wasn't. it was the place that people came to get information, yeah, to get help. People would come to him to ask for help and, and I can remember as well when, of course, when it was uh, totally mostly all white, you know, I can remember gentlemen, white gentlemen being in here talking with him and, and I can imagine they was running for office or something like that because of the influence he would have. Stay with us as we continue our conversation with Simpsons and Daughters Mortuary. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Even though we didn't grow up together, he's my favorite brother. Hey, sis. I'm the baby of the family, and he's the gentle giant. What you know about poor George? Man, please, that's a classic. You know when they say people are a rare breed? Yeah, he's that. I'm sorry, I'll be back in a few hours. Don't worry, sir. You know I'm for you. I know. Go get the football. That was my favorite memory. He was always for you. This is a true story of me, Bridget Floyd, and this guy, George Perry Floyd Jr., my big brother. Thanks for staying with us. If you're just joining us, 
I am speaking with Lutetia Simpson Campbell, daughter of Simpsons and Daughters, and her beautiful daughter, Miss Nicole Malone. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. Next up, I want you to tell us about the pushback that your father probably encountered during that time. We know racism and segregation was rampant. Um, like I said, you would have thought that it might have been a little better because, you know, the um, 1968, the integration, it was written, but just because it was written doesn't mean it's enforced. We know that with the uh, general, uh, with uh, the president, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, when we had the Trail of Tears, when it was written for them to have this, when he just said well, it was not enforced, when the Supreme Court wrote that they would have certain things and Andrew Jackson said, mm, nah. That's exactly right. Or with Juneteenth, yes. even when we were freed, yes. although it was and written, Texas. it still was. It is written, it doesn't mean it's in force. So that was somewhat like here, and you know, um, in 19, um, I don't know if it, was, it began on Clarkwood Street or, or um, I think by the time he came here, it was a little better, mm -hmm. but I, I do know in 64, that he had some pushback. Uh, even if one of the funeral homes here was giving him a little hard time, even though we weren't competitors because we were segregated, right. uh, the prominent funeral home, one of the prominent funeral homes in Atlanta was Seller Brothers. So Sellers did a lot of uh, uh, burials out here, and my father was, uh, was uh, had worked for them mm -hmm. in, the, in the, I guess, the 40s and the 50s. But anyway, they called the funeral home called and said, uh, who is that boy out there? That boy belong to y'all or whatever, you know. And my father told me, he said, he told me, I need to leave that boy alone. Because that, if that boy out there, he know exactly what he is doing. So that was, a, you know, a little better. And I can remember myself, my mother and I, and my, my uh, sister, Belinda, we were coming out here and I think my mother had a Cadillac, and we were driving out here to, to uh, we were getting ready to go to Birmingham. My mother's from Birmingham. I don't know exactly what it was. I don't know if we were picking my father up or what, but anyway, it was some police officers uh, came and shined lights on us, and we were scared and everything, and my father was furious, and he was, went to look to see who they, who they were. That's my children. That, that's my wife. Right. And every time he said we got ready to cross the railroad tracks, Policeman stopped him. Where are you going? He said, look, you stop me once, you stop me twice. But I'm a businessman in this community. And I'm not taking this from y'all. So he went to see the, uh, I don't know who was in charge at the time. He said, I'm tired of your police officers stopping me every time I get ready to cross the railroad track. So they stopped stopping him. Mm -hmm. And then once he told me about he was getting ready to go, you know, I told you he worked at Lockheed. Right. And he worked 11 to 7, he would come here every day. I mean, that, that, it was that circle or that triangle. Mm -hmm. Douglasville, Atlanta, Marietta, every day, faithful. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he had to get a death certificate from a doctor. And it was in the morning, and he was walking. Well, he wasn't getting it, he was giving it to him for him to sign. Okay. And he was walking, and the receptions uh, was coming in, and he was walking behind her, and she opened the door, and he came in, and he set the death certificate down on the desk. He said, this is for the good doc. And she was looking at him, saying, you, you, you coming in the wrong door. You coming in the wrong door. But remember, the door should have been the same door at this time. Mm -hmm. But she wanted he, come to come in. Come, he not come in the door. He said, no, I'm just sending this there for the good doc. And he went on about his business. So later on, he got a call from the doctor, and he thought he was calling about something about the death certificate. Mm -hmm. But he said that he had uh, been rude, he was disrespectful to his uh, receptionist. He said, wait a minute, what are you talking about, man? He said, I thought you called me about the death certificate. He said, no, he said, wait just a minute, man. He said, I'm a veteran, I fought for this country. I'm not taking none of this from you and nobody else, you SOB. I said, what? I said, what you tell him? Your dad was bold. Yeah. He said, well, I'm not going to sign it. He said, don't sign it. And he knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. He was going to go directly to the state. And he signed it. And unfortunately, the, the doctor and his wife had a bad accident. 
and they were killed. And my father was all oh, believing. Come, I said, Dad, that man ain't died because he didn't, he didn't sign. Right. He said, God, will get you. He said, God don't like. I said, Dad, that man. I said, but, but he. He said, that, he but but he swear for it. <laughs> said that. See, you don't be doing stuff. So I said, Daddy, don't say that. He believed. But and then also during that time, a lot of people don't know the funeral homes had to have ambulances. I thought they were just pretty hearse. That ambulance had to be on the field when it was Douglas County. And Whitley had had have his on the field because you had if, if that was during the uh, time you know it was integrating but not quite in but if if a person got hurt it was in an ambulance the black it was white it was when the, he was in a white, white ambulance. ambulance so that that occurred segregated ambulances yeah I never knew yeah that. and granddaddy granddad had his black ambulance on the field yeah. Um, during that time. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I, I didn't know either. Like I said, I didn't know it. It was Mr. Arnold. Arnold. Uh -huh. His name, we call him G-Lord Arnold. Uh -huh. He drove the ambulance. He said he'd be wide open. He'd be going 25 miles out for him, to sir. Uh -huh. And of course, you had segregated uh, hospitals here, too. Uh -huh. of, of us trying to move here, and my mother being a nurse, so you don't have any hospitals there for right. my children. I can't, I, can't, I can't do that. So that's one reason we... And by that time, time was going on and stuff and everything. But but I lived here for a while, and she did too. We both lived here for a while. But it's now it's such a quick shot. It's just it's metropolitan Atlanta now. Yeah, Douglas County is metropolitan. But but it wasn't then. It right. Wasn't considered. But those were some of the things that had come about. And uh, I would like to talk uh, just a brief minute about. Uh, but people are cordial, you know. A lot of things you see on television and people hitting you in the head and stuff. Some of those things that take place directly, then they'll speak. They'll speak good of you as far as, uh, but they didn't necessarily like you. Believe it or not, I I, I actually go through have encountered that yourself. a lot of that. <laughs> and this is two two thousand twenty three. So you can imagine it was like that then as well. But my father, I wouldn't say he was Malcolm X, and I wouldn't say he was Martin Luther King, but he was not a yes or no, a yes or no so he, he spoke his mind. He, held his hand. he was just James J. J. D. Simpson. And he carried a pistol. I mean, I'm not saying it's about gun violence, right, but, right, right. but no, it wasn't that type. You know, right. he never shot anybody, but he, he, he said he kept his, he he kept his, he kept his, he kept his pistol. <laughs> that was during that generation, too, you got Absolutely. to remember. Absolutely. <laughs> mm-hmm. Stay right where you are as we discuss community, commitment, and cultivating longevity within Douglas County when we return with Ms. Leticia Simpson Campbell and Ms. Nicole Malone. I'm District 3 Commissioner and Vice Chair Terenia Carthen, and District Dialogue will return momentarily. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to this edition of District Dialogue. Now, I've been joined by the phenomenal Miss Leticia Simpson Campbell and her daughter, Nicole Malone. And we know that the business here would not be possible if there were not a lineage that could carry it on. Right. We know Ms. Simpson Campbell, you took it on from your father, but yes. now you have your daughter yes. who can take it over from you, including her son, Nikolai. Yes. 
so her other daughter. and who's your other daughter? Her name is Royale. Royale Malone. Royale yes. Malone. So we're talking about a family generation and legacy building within the Douglas County community and within the funeral home business. Yes. So talk to me about what you envision and what's the next plans for Simpson and Daughters Mortuary. So for me, I um, <clears throat> plan on finishing my education um, as far as, um, you know, for uh, mortuary science, first, first and foremost. And then uh, kind of learn, trying to learn some of the tricks to the trade that I know only my grandfather knew, because uh -huh. he was, he was what my mother likes to say, the embalmers embalm. All right. That a lot of people, they call themselves embalmers, but uh -huh. they just did not have it. I got you. So I plan on learning some of those things. I'm trying to learn some of that now, you know, because I've kind of been here like all my life. Like that's the color of me over there from 1980. Oh, wow. And then there's some of me um, on my wall from 1982 and 83. So I've been here in and out all my life, but I pay more attention like now. <laughs> really now, and I hate that I didn't pay more attention when he was up and about walking because I was seeing him here all my life. Right. But I really regret not seeing some of the, the tricks to the trade that mm -hmm. he taught my mom and taught my aunt because I've seen his work mm -hmm. and things that were not his work. And believe me, there is a difference. There's a difference. There is a big difference. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh, wow. Uh -huh. So um, but as far as the rest of the business, there, um, there are some things that I plan on doing to... Um, get us into the um, more modern times mm -hmm. as far as like, you know, um, updating some of the things with the property, the business, you know, mm -hmm. business side and, you know, just, just getting it, you know, back to how I want it. You know, I'm going to first, I'm going to start hoofing it like he did. Okay. Because I think that was great how he got out into the community and start meeting more people. I think that's a great way, yeah. you know, start interacting with Nothing people here. Nothing happens without building relationships, right? That's right. what a community is all building about. Building relationships, so right. And I, and I love being a part of uh, people's lives and getting yeah. to know them. And I know a few people here, uh -huh. but I want to get to know more, not just on this side of the tracks, but on the mm -hmm. other side as well, because cause it's just all one big community. Yeah, so I really want to get to know more people. Mm -hmm. And you know, just um, learning about much more technology and just bringing um, seven daughters into the 21st century. Excellent. So now you have this handsome young man sitting off to the side of us that I, I want to put on camera and just quickly introduce because it, you know to to just know that your grandfather started it, your mother kept it going, you will keep it going, and he will be the fourth generation to Simpsons and, and daughter and her, do and her daughter and your name. daughter. Yes, my the daughter, fourth she generation. Worked, she's, she's been working alone. So his name, on his middle name, is the same as his great grandfather. Wow. He was James Douglas Simpson, so this is Nicholas Douglas Malone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Look, are you like intimidated at all by the legacy that you've just, you know, heard and witnessed throughout the years? Um, I feel like I've had some good history on my great grandfather. And you're ready to follow in his footsteps? Absolutely. It's like I'm ready to take over. Oh, I love it, Nikolai. I love it. I love it. We need that, right? And you have great examples from your mom and your grandmother and, of course, your grandfather. So we can't wait. Douglas County is looking forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you for joining us. How old are you, by the way? I am 14. You're, four, you're a tall 14. Wow. What, what school do you attend? I go to Kips Drive Academy. I am an eighth grader. Kips Academy, a phenomenal school in Atlanta. So, well, look, I look forward to seeing what you're going to do next, and thank you for joining us. Coming up next, we will wrap up and provide our final thoughts on why Simpsons and Daughters Mortuary has been a long-standing business here in Douglas County. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back to District Dialogue. Joining us is Ms. Leticia Simpson Campbell, Ms. Nicole Malone, Nikolai Malone of Simpson and Daughters Mortuary. Now, we heard your daughter talk about how she plans to take Simpson and Daughters Mortuary forward, but we could not have a future 
without a pass. Can you share with us, Ms. Leticia, about your past and your family's history? My father, he was already in business and everything, and um, it was before cell phones and beepers. So the way you got a death call was the person was here, and they would call him the night man. Or if a person wasn't here, he had a telephone at a neighbor's house, which the phone rang here, it rang at her house. So she would answer the phone and she would call the person that was most likely a neighbor to go to do the uh, pickup. Mm -hmm. So as she got older, uh, he, I, I, I saw him saying, I gotta get a phone, I gotta get a phone because she's getting older and she's not gonna be able to do it. And I'm like, oh, okay. I said, well, I was in school. I was at Georgia State University. I was one of those students that took a long ways and I had done all other things, but I had to complete some other things. And so I didn't have to go to school, but I had to write some papers. So I said, well, I'm writing these papers, Daddy. I can answer the phone for you. So I came to answer the phone. So I stayed up here to answer the phone. We took time, terms and stuff, answering the phone. So if someone would be on the phone, and as time went on, he, was, he would say, uh, come and go with me. I said, go with you where? He said, come and go with me to pick up. I said, pick up with you where? <laughs> I was just like the lay public. I was like, I was scared. I mean, I could answer the phone. That was nothing to do, right. but I wasn't going in the back. Mm -hmm. I wasn't picking up anybody either. But as time went on and everything, I started going with him picking up and doing little things. It was a time, it wasn't like overnight. Right. It took time, it took a, a time to do this, to, to do that and everything. So that's what I did. To cultivate your love yes. of, and of the course, business. Of course, as the time went on, you know, the beepers had come in, the cell phones had come in. And mm -hmm. in fact, he had the, be the cell phone with the, the pocketbook looking Brief one. Case. Yes, Briefcase. Briefcase. Right. And it wasn't for fashion, it was for strictly for business for, business yeah. for him. So that's how I got involved. I thought it was going to be temporary. Uh -huh. And I w was able to come back and forth, you know, but that was, uh, had brought me on in. Uh -huh. And then as I started working, I, I said, well, I finished Georgia State, I believe, in that uh, March of 81, and I want to take a breather. And, and I said, well, I'll go ahead and go to school with Gupton Jones. Uh -huh. So at the time, Gupton Jones, I mean, you, you had to, to go to school at that time, but you could only, at the time you could just be, have a diploma or you can have a degree, and the degree is for just starting in okay. at Gupton Jones. Okay. So uh, since I had already had a BS degree and finishing with Georgia State, I transferred a lot of my credits and I was able to get an associate degree in uh, mortuary science. But, a lot of reason why people sometimes don't finish, you have to do an apprenticeship, you have to do a clinical, and it takes time. And I started in 81, and I was licensed in 84, and I had no breaks, so it took wow. that long. And so you just don't just go, it's you, no, process. it's not an overnight process. It right. takes a little time. Right. So, but before that, the way I was just saying, I got to Georgia State, I had started Spelman, I had finished a year of Spelman, and I wanted to go I didn't want to go, not to say I love Spelman, but I was from Atlanta. I wanted to go out of town. So I begged my father to send me to uh, Howard University. So I went there. So you went to D.C.? I sure did. And uh, by the time I was trying to be grown and do my thing and stuff, and I hadn't uh, finished college, I didn't have the money to go back to the uh, HBCU. So I decided to go to Georgia State where I can pay my way so I won't have him telling me, I sent you, you know, so that's what happened. So anyway, um, I worked with him and, uh, and everything and I had another job. I was in law enforcement and, and by that time, my sister saw me doing this and everything, so she decided to come. Y'all wasn't gonna leave her out. No, it was worse than I was as far as I ain't gonna touch this, I ain't gonna touch, mm -hmm. but, but, but when she saw me and everything, I, I kind of backdoor influenced her. So, so you inspired your I inspired daughter. my sister, and she had she gone to Clark, and she was in uh, art. Okay. So she started coming, and I showed her what I knew, mm -hmm. and everything. So she and I worked together, and everything. And then Daddy, he still was working, doing everything, but we were doing 
a lot of the things he was doing. And he was he told us he said y'all are good, y'all doing good, but you're slow. He said I I could I would have done two or three bottles by the time you. He said, and then we just said, okay, daddy, okay, daddy, and then we just continued working together and, and everything. And my sister had become very good at what she was doing, and he gave her the biggest compliment that he could give to her because he didn't give compliments because he felt you're supposed to do your job. Right. So if it's something good, it's supposed to be right. because that's what you're supposed to do. And he told her, you are the best cosmetizer I've seen. We like to fail out. And so she and I worked together very well. And that's why he added daughters because, and I just took it for granted because we was doing it, we was working for my father. We was, we, mean, it, we was, we was Simpson doors, but we was working with my father. At that time, you still didn't see it as, this is my business, I'm building a legacy. You just thought, I'm just working with daddy. I'm just working with daddy. And then, if, cause, cause anything that I thought that I wanted to do, he said, well, you do it when you, it is your turn to do it. This is where I'm gonna do it. And so I didn't have no, cause you didn't have no push. He didn't, it wasn't no well, conversation. You didn't, you didn't talk back. You didn't talk back. You just did what he That's said. Right. That's right. And then as time went on and I saw how he moved, it, he said observable, be, be observable. And his thing was be teachable. And he really was observing. You have to observe him because he didn't do a point by point, blow by blow. You had to look. Mm -hmm. And I think actually when I think back to it was in 93 was the turning point because he got sick. He was not a person to get sick okay. and he had to be, he had to be gone for a little while. So it was on me. Mm -hmm. And so when he saw that I was continuing to carry it on with some help, you know, with some of the people in the community that work with me. He said, and I think I did about 10 calls or so without him. And when he saw that, I guess he said, hmm, okay, she'll be able to do it. But you have to remember that's 81 to 93. You had a good that's a that's a that's a long time. And then and then and even at that, my sister hadn't come yet. She didn't come to the latter part of the 90s. Okay. So because our time difference is maybe 12 or 13 years. Okay. And because my, my father lived, God bless us, he lived to be 95. Wow, what a blessing. Yes. And he was 88 years old. He didn't leave the business. We took him from the business because we, we knew something was different going on with him and uh, we wanted to take care of my, our father. And you so. know what? I believe that him seeing that you all were able to take over the business and do it the way that he would do it yes. was absolutely taking care yes, of him. Yes, that, that made him feel so much yes, better. Because, and now? Yes. Yeah. Because his thing was life like a parent. Life like a parent. Life like a parent. And that was his thing. And, and that was his concentration was on. Ms. Simpson, Campbell, Ms. Malone, Mr. Malone, this has been a great conversation. Thank and I just you. want to thank you all for continuing to be a staple in Douglas County. Yes. and continue in this business. Thank you, Lydia. Um, you so are the epitome of black history. Well, thank you so much, thank and you. we're trying to continue. I'm District 3 Commissioner and Vice Chair Terenia Carthen. Thank you for watching this edition of District Dialogue.